Okay, so let us go on now with the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. So we'll make another little jump in the text because there's another three dots there. And then we come to another of the Buddha's famous statements uh, concerning how to deal with the Dhamma after he's passed away. So this is another one of these uh, important ones. So, um, this is how it goes. Uh, at Boganagara, the Lord stayed at the Ananda Shrine. Uh, and here he said to the monks, Monks, I will teach you four criteria. Listen, pay close attention, and I will speak. Uh, yes, Lord, replied the monks. Uh, just continuing on from where we were before uh, uh, so these are the famous four criteria known as the four uh, Mahapadesa in Pali. Uh, and these are often cited uh, uh, on how to decide what is really the Buddha's teaching <coughs> and what is not. And this is what the Buddha has to say about this. Uh, suppose a monk were to say, Friends, I heard and received this from the Lord's own lips. This is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the Master's teaching. Then, monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then, without approving or disapproving his words, and express his words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in light of the Vinaya. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to conform to the suttas or to the Vinaya, the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is not the word of the Buddha. It has been wrongly understood by this monk, and the matter is to be rejected. But where, on such comparison and review, they are found to conform to the suttas, or the discipline, the vinaya, the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. This is the first criterion here. So this is the famous uh, Mahapadesa in which the Buddha explains how the monks should go about collecting the suttas and the vinaya after he has passed away here. So you can imagine when the Buddha was traveling around India at that time, he would have been to a large number of places, he would have taught a large number of people, and all of these people would have heard certain discourses. Some people would have heard some discourses, other people would have heard other discourses. Venerable Ananda was not always present because he only became the Buddha's attendant toward the end of the Buddha's life, the last 20 years or so, and before that he had different attendants, right? So there was the teachings were kind of spread out, and not everybody had access to all the teachings. In fact, probably nobody had access to all the teachings. And because of that, it was important to have a method by which these teachings could be collected, right? And this is the way, this is that method for collecting uh, these particular, uh, particular teachings. So, you listen to the teachings, and you will see here, it doesn't really matter who that person is, right? The Buddha doesn't say, you should listen to the Arahants, but not, not listen to the other ones. That's not what he says. He says, anybody who claims to have a teaching that comes from the Buddha, in all those cases, you should take that teaching, and you should put it next to the teachings that you know are, are the words of the Buddha already, what is already in the Nikayas, right? What is already in the Vinaya, and if it matters, matches with that, if it fits with that, then it can be ex uh, accepted as also being part of the Buddha's teachings. So a very, a very useful thing, and it, and it means that it doesn't matter who you are as a person, right? It's not about finding out who the Arahants are, because it is impossible to know who the Arahants are anyway. It is the assumption that the Buddha is the Arahant, and everything has to be compared uh, to what the, what the Buddha said. And of course, this has, this has very important implications. Once you decide, once you understand that the main teachings of the Buddha are found in the four Nikayas, right? The Majjhima Nikaya, Diga Nikaya, Anguta Nikaya, and Sanguta Nikaya. Once you see that, and I was trying to show you this morning some of the historical evidence for that, by showing how 
the historical context in the suttas, they fit with the broader historical context in ancient India. Real history and the history of the book seem to match, match together quite nicely. Uh, if you look at some of the later suttas, like Mahayana suttas and that sort of thing, uh, they don't have that kind of historical detail that you find in the early suttas, in the Agamas and, in, and the Nikayas. Uh, so once you have those teachings, uh, uh, and once you recognize that these are very likely to be the earliest teachings of the Buddha on all kinds of grounds, textual grounds, historical grounds, and all of these kind of things, then of course you can start to use the, these things as a comparison for deciding what are later teachings and what are earlier teachings. Yeah, so you can, for example, one of the things that we can do, you can take the Mahayana suttas, you can compare the Mahayana suttas with the suttas in the Nikayas, and then you can decide whether they really are authentic or not. Are they equivalent to the word of the Buddha? And what you find is that many of the things in the Mahayana suttas, a lot of it is just pretty much the same, right, as you find in the Nikayas, uh, similar kind of teachings. Uh, but then occasionally you find things that look a, look a little bit different. Uh, and those things that look different, then you can set them to one side. Uh, and you can say, okay, don't know about that. Uh, I'm not going to worry so much about that. Uh, but those things that are the same, I can use that to, to, uh, f you know, for, for my inspiration or whatever. Uh, and this then is the way to do that. The same thing is true of contemporary teachers. If you have a contemporary teacher, whatever they say also needs to be compared with the suttas to see whether actually they are real, real teachings or not. It's actually a little bit different because in here, what we are really doing here is we are collecting the suttas, right? The Buddha is saying that this is how you collect them, how you include them in the sutta. Pitaka and the Vinaya, and of course that job is finished a long time ago, but you can expand that same principle to use, to kind of compare to modern teachers as well, to see whether they are teaching uh, the right thing or not. Uh, that's how you do that. Uh, so very important principle, one of the nice little stories that you find in the Vinaya Pitaka uh, is a story uh, you find at the very end of the Vinaya Pitaka uh, around the first council. Uh, you know what the first council is? Uh, yeah? The first council is what happened after the Buddha. All the monks would meet together and they would chant, recite the, the teachings of the Buddha to kind of uh, lay them down, to have them ready for future generations. Uh, now one of the things that happens there, there's an old monk that comes along. His name is uh, Pu Purana. And Purana, he, he comes along and he says to the other monks, that's all very well that you have chanted the suttas, uh, but I have heard the suttas from directly from the Buddha myself, and those are the suttas that I want to remember. I don't care what you have chanted, uh, right? Uh, that's what he says to all the monks. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's very interesting, right? Because uh, one of the things that that shows uh, the, for the whole point of the first council is to bring all the monks together to decide what is the authentic teachings of the Buddha, right? That's the whole point of this. And then this other monk com comes along and he says, well, that's all very well that you've done this, but I still want to remember my teachings as I have heard them. Right? So you can see that it's like a clash there. On the one hand, we have codified, we have laid down what are the authentic teachings. Then there are all these other monks wandering around saying, we want to, we want to kind of remember things our own way. And it's very interesting that that's actually included in the Vinaya. Because this fact that somebody comes along and says, I don't want to listen to what you guys have been doing, it sort of goes against the whole idea of laying down a, a standard for what is the teaching of the Buddha. It almost diminishes the value of that, because somebody says, I don't want to believe in that. And yet, it is included in the Vinaya. Which is fascinating, because it shows you that in the early Sangha, there wasn't much propaganda, there wasn't much kind of censorship. If anything would be censored, that is the kind of stuff you would take out, because it kind of goes against the whole stream, goes against the whole idea of the First Council, which is to unify the teaching. Here is somebody who disagrees, who says he doesn't want to do that, and yet that story is included in the Vinaya. And to me, that is a, it's one of those things that makes the teachings in the suttas, in the Vinaya, makes them true, it makes them uncensored, it makes, makes them real. The fact that they haven't taken out things that obviously seem to counter everything else you find in there. And this is what you find in many places in the suttas. You find little things like that, that are unusual, that are different, and seem to somehow sometimes contradict what you would expect to find in the suttas. And to me, that's another sign of authenticity, that these are real 
uh, real teaching. So you can find that teaching at the very second last chapter of the Vinaya Pitaka in the Chulavaga, fourth book of the Vinaya Pitaka. Okay, so that is the first great standard, right? And there's three more, and they are pretty much uh, the same as the earlier ones. And suppose a monk were, were to say, in such a such a place there is a community with elders and distinguished teachers. I have heard and received this from that community. And what he has heard is, this is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the Master's teaching. And the third one, suppose a monk were to say, in such or such a place, there are many elders who are learned, bearers of the tradition, who know the Dhamma and discipline and the code of rules. Uh, and they say, this is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the Master's teaching. This is the third criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there is one elder who is learned. I have heard and received this from that elder. Uh, and again, this is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the master's teaching. So you can see in all cases, it goes back to this is the Dhamma, this is the master's teaching. These are not the teaching of the individual monks or the groups of monks, but actually the teaching of the Buddha themselves that they are talking about. And it's only those teachings of the Buddha that should really then be included in the canon. With a few exceptions, we know that there are some teachings there from Venerable Sariputta and that sort of thing, but generally speaking, it all comes from the Buddha. And it means that the Buddha is the gold standard, right? His teachings are the ones that really matter in this particular case. Um, okay, so those, there you are. These are the uh, four uh, great standards uh, and uh, very important standards that are, are often quoted in the uh, in the Buddhist tradition. So, uh, and then, so, but where on such comparison and review they are found to conform to the suttas and the Vinaya, then the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is the word of the Buddha, it has been rightly understood by this monk. And then that sutta goes into the Anguttara Nikaya, or wherever it is, it, uh, part, of the, uh, part of the collection. Uh. So, um, the result of all of this, uh, once all of these suttas were collected together, uh, and the result of that is basically what we now have, as I said before already many times already, uh, the four main Nikayas of the Pali Canon, long, middle length, connected and numerical discourses. Uh, that's basically the, the result of all of that. Uh, and anything outside of that, uh, and also part of the Vinaya as well, especially the Patimoka rules and some of the other regulations of the Vinaya, also part of that. But anything apart from that is not really part of what we here call the word of the Buddha. It comes outside of the word of the Buddha, which is a lot, right? You start thinking about it. Whoa, there's so much in the Buddhist tradition that is not the part of the Buddha. In fact, the vast, vast majority is not really the word of the Buddha at all. And it's great to be able to do that, it's great to be able to... Uh, to kind of narrow things down, what are the things that we really need to look at and to learn, because otherwise it tends to be too much. If you just uh, spend your, if you just read the four Nikayas for the rest of your life and nothing else, uh, there's plenty enough material there to keep it going for the rest of your life. Uh, you don't actually have to go any further than that, right? Uh, you know that, you know that already. Uh, uh, and. Uh, Sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's nice to, we, we like to learn the Abhidhamma and these kind of things. And it can be interesting to learn a little bit of Abhidhamma, but I w personally I would say there is enough already with the suttas. Uh, and if you start to learn Abhidhamma on top of that, uh, uh, often there isn't enough time to do all the other important things in life that we need to do. Uh, and uh, so keep to the main, the basis, right? Uh, and often that is, uh, will take you far, take you a long, long, long way along the path if you do it that way. Uh. Okay, so uh, let us move on to the next part. Uh, so now again we're making a little bit of a jump and now we're coming very close to the Buddha's passing away towards the very end. Then the Lord said to Venerable Ananda, it might happen, Ananda, that Chunda, the smith, 
should feel remorse, thinking, it is your fault, Frenchunda, it is by your misdeed that the Tathagata gained final Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. <laughs> that would be terrible. Imagine somebody telling you that, uh, that you gave the last meal and Buddha died because of you. Oh, that would be pretty, pretty very unpleasant. Uh, I don't know if you remember the story. The story is that, of course, that the Buddha, again, he's getting very close to Kushinara, where his passing away is going to be. And just before he arrives at Kushinara, uh, he has a meal at uh, this Chunda, the smith, uh, who offers him this strange food. Sukara Madhava is called in Pali. Nobody knows exactly what it means. Sukara means pig. Madhava, no, very unclear what it means, but it's some kind of meal that causes the Buddha to get very sick, get a very bad stomach and, uh, and, and diarrhea and all of these kind of things. And um, uh, so then, soon after that, the Buddha dies, right? Uh, he gets very, uh, very faint, maybe has uh, dysentery and, and, and all, kind of, all kind of serious problems, uh, and he dies soon after that. Uh, so one of the questions is, in the, in the, according to the, one of the questions that we can ask sometimes is, well, what did he actually die from, right? He has just before, he has said that he renounced the life faculty three months before he was supposed to die. And now he eats some food that is obviously bad, it's, it's poisonous or whatever. And then now he looks like he's dying from that. So what did the Buddha actually die from? Old age. Old age. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so old age is not, 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 a bad, not a bad idea at all. Old age is obviously a very important part of it, right? Uh, so obviously he was getting very weak, so of course the dysentery or whatever you have is certainly going to be, be much worse if you have old age. Uh, so old, I think old age is pretty much, pretty much right. So I think the, the idea that you, have, you can extend or shorten your life according to your will, uh, that is just a kind of a little bit here and there, right? Uh, depending on kind of the exact circumstance. But old age is basically the problem. Now one way of finding out which one is true, of course, uh, is to do a comparative study of the various suttas. The Mahaparinibbana Sutta exists in different traditions. Uh, it exists in Chinese translation. There's one in Sanskrit translation as well. And uh, uh, in those other translations, there is no mentioning of the food that the Buddha was eating just before he died. Uh, so if you do a comparative study, it looks like this actually is not really part, not really part of it at all. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I think that also it is a very natural cause that people die of food poisoning, right? This happens, can happen quite naturally. Uh, so in one way, I think that the Pali one is kind of, again, humanizes the Buddha, makes him, makes him very human. All these other things about, you know, I'm going to uh, let go of the life faculty and in and in one place in the suttas, it says that, well, if I could actually live on for the eon, is one of the things it says in one of the suttas, which is very strange. How can you live on for an eon with a body like this? This body is not going to look very good after an eon, right? It's going to look pretty, after, even after 100 years, you look pretty decrepit. Imagine what you look, look like after an eon. It's going to be pretty bad news. So it's kind of, I, I, it's hard to take that seriously, that you can live on for an eon with an ordinary human body. So there is, seems to be a little bit of tension in the Mah Mahaparinibbana Sutta. On the one hand, you have the natural explanations, right? Dying of old age, dying of eating food that has gone bad or whatever. And on the other hand, you have these slightly supernatural things happening. Mara coming to the Buddha, Mara asking, please Buddha, please take Parinibbana. We don't want you around anymore. And the Buddha says, oh yeah, maybe you have a point. Buddha is listening to Mara, right? And kind of, it, it's very strange. The whole thing just doesn't kind of sound like the Buddha. Here is the wisest person in the world. He's supposed to know what he's supposed to do. He's not supposed to take advice from Mara. He's the last person you should take advice from her. By the way, you know that our Buddhist temple in Perth is in Nola Mara? You know that? <laughs> It's a pretty good place to have a Buddhist temple, right? Nola Mara. It works really well here in Malaysia. When you <laughs> Nola. Nola Mara. <laughs> it's good, right? Buddhist temple in Olamara couldn't be couldn't be much couldn't be much better than that. So there is a little bit of tension in this Maha Parinibbana Sutta between the supernatural things on the one hand and the kind of natural things on the other hand. And I am always the kind of person, I tend to prefer the natural explanations. Why? Because the Buddha throughout history has tended to be elevated too much. You see that in the Mahayana teachings, you see that in the commentaries of the Pali tradition, you see that certainly in the Tibetan tradition, and everything is elevated completely out of proportion in a 
way which is very detrimental to a proper understanding of the suttas. And for that reason, I tend to prefer to bring things down back to earth again, right? If you have an ordinary, normal human body, these are the kind of things that you can expect. You can expect to die of dysentery. You can expect these kind of things. So I kind of like that explanation. There's also the very curious thing at the very end, just before the Buddha is about to die. He is in Kusinara, right? And Venerable Ananda says to the Buddha, well, why are you going to die here? This dinky little town, right? This, <laughs> there's nothing here. There's a way out in the bush somewhere far and beyond. Why don't you instead die in one of the big cities in India? The big cities at that, that time were Savati, Rajagaha, Rajagaha Vesali, Champa, Kosambi, and Saketa. These were the six great cities in India at the time. You will notice that uh, uh, Pataliputra is missing, which is very interesting because Pataliputra became a very big city shortly after that. But at this point, it is still missing. And it shows you again that we're dealing with the early discourses. No real change has been made to accommodate uh, later, uh, later developments. So, uh, and this is what he says, right? And one of the re one possible explanation for that is because Buddha got unexpectedly sick towards the very end and then died before maybe he reached the Sakyan country, before he got to uh, Savati or whatever. It's one possible explanation. There are many other possible explanations. Uh, it's just one possible idea why these things happened. Uh, so, uh, Anyway, my point is just that uh, sometimes the natural explanations are, are better. As soon as the Buddha has passed away, then the supernatural explanations start to emerge. And you can see why that is the case, right? As soon as the Buddha has passed away, there's a feeling of great lack in the Sangha, a great lack among the lay people. Uh, there's like a hole, something is missing in people's life. We need to fill that hole with something. Uh, and they start asking questions about the Buddha's life. Who was really the Buddha? And then the uh, legends and the myths start to proliferate. That's how you get the jatakas, that's how you get the commentaries. All of these legends starting to proliferate about who the Buddha actually was. That's how the bodhisattva ideal starts to arise, right? Both in Theravada and also later on in Mahayana as well. All of these things, I think they arise from a sense of lack, a sense of something missing in, in people's lives. And you can see it starting already in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta because this Sutta obviously it was not it, it is a narrative, it is a story. It was obviously created after the Buddha passed away. And the reason we know that is because some of the events at the very end of the Sutta, they happened after the Buddha's passing away. So the Sutta as a whole must have been created after the Buddha passed away. So as soon as passed away, some of these more mythological, legendary elements quite likely would have made, the, made their way into the suttas already. Because that is the general development of Buddhism after the Buddha passed away here. So just making these little points, just to, sometimes it's important to have a little bit of a critical eye, right? Not to kind of just say, say sadhu to everything and think everything is great. Because if you have no critical eye, you end up believing all kind of crazy stuff. And this is part of the problem here. So we need a little bit of critical, it's always a, always a positive thing here. Okay. So, uh, but it's, and then of course, so then the Buddha says, but Chunda's remorse should be dispelled in this way. This is your merit, Chunda. This is your good deed that the Tathagata gained final Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. For, friend Chunda, I have heard and understood from the Lord's own lips that these two almsgivings are of great fruit, of very great result, more fruitful and advantageous than any other. Which two? The one is the almsgiving after eating which the Tathagata attained supreme awakening, the other that after which he gained the Nibbana element without remainder at his final passing. These two almsgivings are more fruitful and profitable than all others. Chunda's deed is conducive to long life, to good looks, to happiness, to fame, to heaven, and to lordship, to supremacy. In this way, Ananda, Chunda's remorse is to be expelled. So, uh, 
it is quite touching the way the Buddha looks after individuals, right? Usually the Buddha is a teacher to the large crowds of people, to large assemblies of people coming together, hundreds of monks, hundreds of lay people. But he actually remembers also individuals and the dangers for individuals. And here is Chunda, you know, and the Buddha has a sense of gratitude. Chunda has given him something, tried to support him on the very last few days of his life. And the Buddha has enough gratitude to say, uh, go back to Chunda, make sure that he doesn't fall into depression or sadness because of this. Uh, make sure you tell him that this, what he has done is actually a very positive thing here. Yeah. It's very, very beautiful and quite touching that somebody who's like the wisest person, right? The one with the most insight from a Buddhist point of view in the whole world also does these very simple human things and makes sure that everybody is happy about it. It's very, uh, to me, it has a very human and beautiful touch about it. There's a similar thing with Venerable Sariputta as well. This is from the uh, Vinaya Pitaka again. And there is a man who wants to ordain as a monk. And all the monks say, and the Buddha asked them, well, what do you think, monks? And all the monks said, nah, he's no good, he's really kind of, I don't like him, don't really want him to ordain. And then the Buddha asked, what about you, Venerable Sariputta? And Venerable Sariputta thinks, well, I remember one time, a long time ago, he gave me some alms food, right? He, he supported me, and because he supported me at that time, I have gratitude to him. Because I have gratitude, gratitude to him, I think he should be ordained. Right? Then that man is ordained and he becomes a monk as a consequence. And this is one of those things about a great mind, a mind which is really developed in the Dhamma in the right way, is a mind that has gratitude and thankfulness. It's a very rare quality to find in the world. Not many people have real gratitude in their heart. It can be very difficult to develop. We maybe take gifts and things for granted. But it's one of the signs that somebody is really developed, that they have that, that sense of gratitude attitude in them. Huh? Yeah, and here you can see it in the Buddha. You can see it in Venerable Sariputta, right? The master and his number one disciple, they have these qualities, of course. And of course, many other monks and nuns would as well, many of the lay people, but they are quite unusual uh, qualities. Huh? So, um, there are other stories as well about the Buddha, how he looks after individuals. There's one very touching story also found in the Vinaya. And this is a story of a monk who has dysentery again. And because he has dysentery, you know, you have diarrhea, and it's just terrible, terrible illness. Because you're just so, everything is so filthy and so bad. And then uh, he is sit, the Buddha is walking around to the kutis, to the huts of the monks. And he sees this monk lying there, really filthy, really disgusting because of the dysentery and all this. And then he asks the monks, how come nobody is looking after this monk? He is sick, he is in a bad state. Right, sure, he's disgusting, but I mean, you still have to help somebody when they're sick. You have to kind of do what needs to be done. And then the monks say that, well, he is of no help to anyone, and because he is of no help to anyone, we don't help him. It's like a business deal, right? Either he helps us and we help him, or, or whatever. And then the Buddha tells them, and then the Buddha says, come Ananda, he says to Ananda. And then the Buddha and Ananda, they wash this monk down, right? Put on clean robes, all this kind of thing. Yeah. And then after they have kind of cleaned him and bathed him and dressed him and kind of made him kind of feel, feel okay again, then the Buddha says to the monks, he says, monks, you have no mother and father. You have nobody to look after you. If you don't look after each other, who is going to do it? So again, a beautiful example. Here is the foremost spiritual teacher in the world. And he washes down a monk who is kind of really filthy, really disgusting, because he has a terrible illness. He does that with Venerable Ananda. And then afterwards, he gives the, the bhikkhus a simple teaching on how to look after each other. This is the Buddha, right? These are some of the qualities we often forget about when we think about the Buddha. But of course, the quality of a real spiritual master is not the, just that you can give teachings, but it's also that you have the very basic spiritual values of humility, of kindness, of gratitude, and these kind of things at the same time. And the Buddha too shows these qualities when you know where to look in the suttas. So this is what uh, this story of Chunda reminds me of. Uh, all these uh, marvelous qualities that the Buddha 
actually had. And all the great monks to the present day, they also have these kind of qualities. Uh, and the nuns, and the great lay people also, by the way. I don't mean to leave you out at all. We're all part of the same path, right? So all the same things, basically, here. Okay, so it is one of the things that I always feel I need to say. A lot of the suttas, they are always spoken to the monks. And of course, the reason why they're spoken to the monks is because the monks were usually the audience immediately around the Buddha. Huh? Because they were the people that he ha hung, hung out with the most, right? He was hanging out with the monks uh, for obvious reason, because they were part of the same sangha, the same group. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that these teachings are not applicable to other people. Very often it would also be the case that he would address the monks, but in the assembly there would also be nuns, bhikkhunis, or there would be lay people there, right, in the assembly. But it is the, uh, the way that the suttas are written, it is always addressed to the monks when, when, when you speak to somebody. Huh? So this is how, just how the uh, convention was at that time. Huh? It doesn't mean that these things are not uh, relevant for everybody else at, at the same time. Huh? So please keep that in mind, so you don't feel so, feel so left out, right? Which is not very nice to feel left out. We want to bring you into the warmth of, the, of these teachings. And uh, the Lord said, so now we're jumping forward again, getting closer and closer to the final awakening here. The Lord said, Ananda, these sal trees have burst forth into an abundance of untimely blossoms, uh, which fell upon the Tathagata's body, sprinkling it and covering it in homage. Divine coral tree flowers fell from the sky, divine sandal powder uh, fell from the sky, sprinkling and covering the Tathagata's body in homage. Divine music and song sound from the sky in homage to the Tathagata. Never before has the Tathagata been so honored, revered, esteemed, worshipped and adored. And yet, Ananda, whatever monk, nun, male and female lay followers, there you are, everyone, everyone is here, <laughs> dwells practicing the Dhamma properly and perfectly fulfills the Dhamma way, he or she honors the Tathagata, reveres and esteems him and pays him the supreme homage. Therefore, Ananda, we will dwell Practice in the Dhamma properly and perfectly fulfill the Dhamma way. Uh, this is how you should practice. Yeah, so this is one of the other things that is so important to remember uh, in the Buddhist teaching uh, is that often we do too many rituals, right? Uh, sometimes rituals just become endless. Uh, but it's not by doing rituals that we pay homage to the Buddha. It is actually by practicing the path that we do the real homage to the Buddha. This is what the Buddha is saying here. Uh, so very important. Remember the reason why the Buddha is teaching all of us uh, is so that we can be more happy, right? He's teaching us to lift us up, to get us out of suffering, get us out of the pile of dung, as it says in Ajahn Brahm's nice little book, right? Out of the pile of dung, but then we decide to dive into the dung again. Uh, this is what, the, <laughs> this is what the, the little worm does, right? The worm is like the dung, so they dive back in again afterwards. Uh, and, but the Buddha's point is to help us, and he gives us these teachings, he gives us this path to help us out of suffering. He's doing this out of compassion, and then he sees us just doing rituals, just doing all kind of stuff, and not actually practicing properly. Then of course, he, he will feel that's a shame, because we have the opportunity to do the practice in a good way, and then we end up wasting our time doing rituals which actually go nowhere instead. Actually, rituals can go a little bit. I shouldn't say go nowhere. I think it's unfair to the rituals. A little bit of rituals is fine, right? You bow down to the Buddha and you light some candles and incense. You do a bit of chanting. And sometimes that can lift your spirits a little bit. It can be a positive contribution. But remember, it should be a positive contribution. It should not be something which becomes an end-all and be-all of your Buddhist practice, right? Chanting for hours and hours and hours, doing rituals, and all of these kind of things, which is so common in the Buddhist world. Wherever you go in the Buddhist world, except maybe the BGF, I'm not sure. If you <laughs> 
where, almost wherever you go in the Buddhist world, oh, so many rituals, right? Oh, rituals, rituals, rituals. Uh, and it is a bit of a shame. Even at Bodhinyana Monastery, you might think in Australia, not too many rituals. Even there sometimes, a little bit of ritual. Maybe sometimes a little bit too much. I'm not going to talk about that now. If you're interested in that, I can talk about that <laughs> later on to you. The Buddha says the practice is what matters because that is what he wants us to do. That is why he's teaching us to help us. And if we don't take it up, of course, he's going to be a little bit disappointed as a consequence. So, there you are. That is a, that famous little passage on, on the real way of paying homage uh, to the Buddha. Then we jump forward again, another little passage from the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Then Subhadda approached the Lord, exchanged courtesies with him, and sat down to one side, saying, Venerable Gautama, all those ascetics and Brahmins who have orders and followings, who are teachers, well-known and famous as founders of schools, and popularly regarded as saints, like Purana, Purana Kasapa, Makkali Gosala, Ajita Kesakambali, Pakkuda Kachayana, Sanjaya Blattaputta, and Niganta Nataputta. Have they all realized the truth as they make, uh, all make out? Or have none of them realized it? Or have some realized it and some not? Right? This is kind of one of these eternal questions that people always asking themselves. Who are the Arahants in the world? What are the right religion, right? Even in the present day, sometimes it's so hard to know who are the real Arahants. So many people who look like they have their act together, and sometimes it's just so difficult to kind of pinpoint these things. And uh, here the Buddha gives you a very nice answer. What should we do in this particular case, right? How do we actually decide these things? There are other ways of deciding these things as well, but this is one of the nice ways of, of looking at this. Enough, Subhada, never mind whether all or none or some of them have realized the truth. I will teach you Dhamma, Subhada. Listen, pay close attention, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, said Subhadda, and the Lord said, In whatever Dhamma and discipline the Noble Eightfold Path is not found, no ascetic is found of the first, the second, the third, or the fourth grade. But such ascetics can be found of the first, second, third, and fourth grade in a Dhamma and Vinaya where the Noble Eightfold Path is found. So that is the criteria, right? That is the criterion for where you find people. The ascetic of the first, second, third, and fourth grade refers to the stream mentors, once returners, non returners, and the arahants. That's what it refers to. So wherever the noble eightfold path is found, that is where you find these kind of uh, these kind of beings. And of course, the noble eightfold path includes two very important things. It includes a right view at the beginning, and it includes a right samadhi at the very end. This is what that path includes. And if those factors aren't there, then there are good grounds for being dubious as to whether people have achieved awakening in that particular path. These uh, teachers that you see here, Purana Kasapa, Makkali Gosala, these were the most famous teachers at that time in India. Niganta Nataputta was a leader of the Jains, right, at that time, very, very ascetic. And some of these other ones here, they had really some very strange doctrines and teachings. If you're interested in those teachings, you can read about them in the Samanya Pala Sutta, which is the second sutta of the uh, Diga Nikaya. Uh, to give you some examples of the teaching, one of these, he taught that uh, if you go along the, the banks of the river Ganges, uh, you go on the southern bank and you slaughter all animals and all beings and all humans on the southern bank and make a massive pile of flesh, you have done nothing wrong, everything is okay. Uh, then if you go along the northern side of the, of the river uh, banks of the river Ganges, and you are generous, you give, you are kind and supportive to everyone you meet. You have made no merit at all, uh, right? Uh, imagine what a terrible teaching, right? It's a really, really bad teaching. Imagine what that does to people. If you have faith in these people, gee, 
really, really bad news. Uh, another of those famous teacher, teachings was that uh, uh, the world is made up of seven elements, right? The form, uh, the kind of physical, uh, the earth element, the water element, the air element, the space element, the consciousness element. Uh, when you cut a being in half with a sword, uh, all you're doing is inserting the sword between the elements. Uh, so you haven't done nothing wrong, right? Because it's just inserting the sword between various elements. Uh, this is other kind of teaching here. Another famous teaching <laughs> that was around at that time was materialist teaching. The idea that when you die, everything comes to an end, everything stops. Just like people today who are atheists, right, or materialists or scientists, when you die, that's it, everything comes to an end. Those views already existed at the time of the Buddha. People already had these kind of ideas, right? Sometimes you will see the argument is made that oh, the only reason why the Buddha taught rebirth is because it was part of the culture at that time. And because it was part of the culture, the Buddha took it on board and he taught the same thing. First of all, this is not how the Buddha works. The Buddha is someone who always investigates, always looks at everything, asks questions very thoroughly. He doesn't just take on board cultural beliefs, right? Point number one. Point number two uh, is that uh, there were already, as I've just told you now, there were already, these beliefs already existed. And the Buddha knew about all these beliefs. He had already checked out the various philosophical teachings at the time, right? They already existed at that time. It wasn't 100% culturally accepted, the idea of rebirth in those days. And thirdly, the Buddha specifically says in the suttas that he recalled his past lives prior to his awakening. This is an integral part of his awakening experience. So all of these things, it shows us that some of these ideas that kind of arise, especially in the, some kind of Western world, some people who find it, find it very hard to believe in rebirth, but I want to be a Buddhist. I don't want to believe in rebirth, but I want to be a Buddhist. How can I make this work? Okay, okay, the Buddha said that just because of cultural belief. Okay, that, that is the answer. And that is kind of the way people think, right? I would like to be a Buddhist, but I can't believe in rebirth. So how can I kind of squeeze this together in such a way that I can kind of work it out in one way or another? That's kind of how, how the thinking goes. And uh, unfortunately, it gives rise to a lot of uh, distortion of actually the Buddha's teachings, which is very unfortunate, I think, yeah. So, uh, you can see here also how rich the India was at the time, rich in philosophies, rich in religions, right? All these debates going on all the time between adherence of one sect and adherence of another sect. Sometimes some of the Jains, they would come to the Buddha and they would argue with the Buddha and say, the Jains teaching is better, no, our teaching is better. And they would have a discussion together and sometimes there would be people going from one religion over to another one. A very interesting time and very open-minded, right? People were really so open-minded about religion. Today in the world, I think it's difficult to find almost anywhere that was so open-minded as India was at that time. Everybody discussing, any theory was okay, anybody was allowed to say anything, and then you kind of sorted it out. A very, very kind of, I think, wholesome and good way of, um, of dealing with religion that they had at that time. So, uh, anyway, so Subhadda then uh, decides on, on that basis uh, after he is, uh, uh, he is taught by the Buddha in this way. The Buddha says, now Subhadda, in this Dhamma and training, the Noble Eightfold Path is found. And, it, uh, and in it are to be found the, the ascetics of the first, second, third and fourth kind or grade uh, in this particular Dhamma and teaching here. So then Subhadda, after that, he decides to become a disciple of the Buddha. He ordains and he becomes a stream enter, I think, or something like that, becomes an Arya, I believe. And he becomes the last personal disciple of the Buddha as, as a consequence. So the Buddha is on his deathbed, right? He's still ordaining people. Pretty, pretty impressive, right? Doesn't <laughs> No, until the last breath, you keep on doing preaching the Dhamma and ordaining people until the very, very end. Very last moment, yes. So it's actually quite, uh, it's quite nice again. He, does, you know, he spends his life to the absolute maximum. Basically, he's just living for others. That's what he's living for, and for nobody. Not for himself, in a sense, because he has already done everything he can for himself. 
Okay, then we come to the very last paragraph. <coughs> Again, we're making a bit of a jump, moving forward. Uh, and now we're coming even closer to the Buddha's final passing away here. And the Lord said to Ananda, Ananda, it may be that you will think the teacher's instruction has ceased. Now we have no teacher. It should not be seen like this, Ananda, for what I have taught and explained to you as Dhamma and Vinaya will at my passing be your teacher. Yeah, so this is again reinforcing the view that I have been kind of talking about all the way through the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. When the Buddha has passed away, there is one thing that is the teacher and that we can take, and that is the suttas that the Buddha taught. That is our teacher. That is the final standard. That is what everything else should be measured up, up against. It doesn't mean that we cannot listen to other teachers. We can because there are many inspiring and good and interesting teachers in the world that have the ability to present the Dhamma in various ways and nice ways. But it means that this is the final standard. This is what we have to go back to. If there is a clash of opinion, then it is a teaching of the Buddha that decides who is right and where we should be, where we should be going here. So again, just reinforcing that uh, final uh, that point of view, which I think is important. And remember that uh, uh, apart from the Buddha, apart from the four Nikayas, Everything else is not the teaching of the Buddha. Everything else is the teaching of the disciples, right? From starting with the Jatakas, starting with the Abhidhamma, the commentaries, the Mahayana Suttas, all of that, a whole gamut, if you like, all of that is a teaching, not the teaching of the Buddha, but teaching of disciples and teaching of other people, right? Me sitting here is kind of Maybe it's really dodgy what I'm saying, right? Maybe really, really bad. So it's the same kind of thing. So you have to be very careful when you listen to me, not to kind of swallow it, kind of like gulping it down as if it is the absolute truth, because some of, some of the things I say, no doubt, will not be perhaps 100% accurate, right? So you take that too with a sense of caution, a sense of investigation, looking at it in the, good way, in the right way. And then uh, you will move forward uh, on the path. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any teachers. You need to have teachers. Uh, I remember when I first came to Bodhinyana Monastery, about almost 22 years, or was it 23? Maybe 23. Gee, time goes very fast. Almost 23 years now since I first got to Bodhinyana Monastery. And um, at that time, Ajahn Brahm was teaching suttas. He doesn't do that so much anymore, but he did that back then. And I remember I learned how to read the suttas by listening to Ajahn Brahm, because he would do all the cross connections, right? Showing how one sutta connects to another one, showing the big jigsaw puzzle, this big puzzle, and how each bit in the puzzle kind of fits together with the other ones, uh, right? Dependent origination, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, 37 Bodhipakadamas, the Five Khandas, the Six Sense Spaces, the Five Hindrances, everything has, fits into this big picture. Uh, and you start to see that, you start to understand the big picture. Uh, and for that reason, it's very helpful to have somebody to teach you. Uh, uh, but as you get taught, uh, you gradually learn to be independent. You gradually learn to see things for yourself uh, and to start to make your own decisions on how to uh, interpret the Dhamma in the right way. Yeah. And this is the beautiful thing of this. You start with teachers uh, and then gradually you learn a sense of independence in these teachings. Uh, right? Sometimes you, you see students, right? they come to the uh, class year after year and suddenly one year they don't come anymore. Right? Why is that? Because they have graduated. They have understood, right? Okay, now don't have to come anymore. You're okay. You can kind of do your own thing and you can keep practicing for yourself. And that's perfectly fine. Now. Okay, so that is all for now. So uh, um, we will come back again at what time is it? We're going to sit five o'clock, is that right? So five o'clock, we'll do some more meditation together. Uh, I think we need some meditation now. I'm certainly probably going to be nodding afterwards. But anyway, we'll see how the meditation goes afterwards. And then we have some Q&A in the evening. So I'll see you back again at five o'clock. Yeah.